right, what's going on guys? So I'm back at the S2000. The purpose of this video, I'm going to go through everything that I had to do to get this car running. Now, this is a 2001 S2000, which is an AP1 S2000. I've got a basic street tune on it. Now, the difference between a street tune and a dyno tune, some guys completely refuse to do anything street tuning. But if you do it safe, if you know, and it's still a little bit of a risk, but um, you can still put a street tune on a car and uh, I wouldn't drive it around forever, but you can drive it around if you have to. Not that I would recommend it at all, um, but you can drive it around if you have to. Um, and depending on how good the street tune is, you can actually drive it around for a little while. The biggest thing that you that is the issue with street tuning is you can't put an accurate timing map on um, on a car by doing a street tune. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but it's, I, I can't do it um, with the car like as it is right now. So uh, anyway, so. The reason for this video is that you can't just take a, uh, like if, you, I mean, I don't know if people are out there thinking this, but if you buy an engine management for your car, you can't just take it, like say I have a, a Haltech um, EMS, which it's plug and play, you plug it into the factory system, Now you can't just take it and plug it in and expect everything to work. It will work considering nothing else is done to the engine. You can drive it around, you can plug it in like that, you can drive it around and you can keep it in your car until you until you do upgrades and change out, you know, put a turbo in or fuel injectors or start changing out sensors to like higher, um, like you know, bigger map sensor, things like that. You can't just plug it in and expect it to work. It's not like the USB thing in the computer, like you get a new mouse and you plug it in and hey, we recognize that you plugged in a new device and you know, then it works magically. This is where tuners come in. So you would hire a, a tuner, somebody that you would trust or, you know, recommended from friends or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> you would hire a tuner and they would go in and they would do the stuff that I'm going to show you how to do today, with the exception of putting a dyno tune on it. Now, I, I'm not, I, I do have a slot <clears throat> for getting this car, uh, for dynoing this car and, and putting a good dyno tune on it. Should take about two hours, but it's good to have another little hour. Um, anyway. This ECU manager software, just to, to get it working, to install it and get it working right, uh, install it from the CD, um, go up here to options, communications, and I'm going to go back to this this little section because I don't have to talk about that in a bit, um, communication port, um, I selected the one that I have highlighted, if you have more than one that pop up and you can put it on auto and it should automatically detect which one the, the engine management, which USB the engine management's on. and. Um, make sure the car is because the key has to be turned on in order for it to um, talk to the engine management. So right now I'm look we're looking at the configuration stuff that's on the computer because I have the cable plugged in. Um, so you want to have the right COM port. Click OK. And you should be able just to go up here and, and connect and press this uh, connect disconnect button, and then it connects and it works. If you can't get it to connect, then uh, close out this software. Uh, this Haltech EMS software and then open it back up power cycle the um, The car's computer which is pretty much like you know turn off the key and turn the key back on ignition on So the sensor that's been upgraded on this the first one that I'm going to talk about is The map sensor which is Stanifold stands for manifold absolute pressure sensor now the map sensor It determines the the uh, absolute pressure or pressure for all the intensive purposes pretty much the, um, it it measures the pressure that is inside your intake manifold. So on the stock version of this car, it had a map sensor that went up to 70 kPa, I believe. kPa is kilopascals. That's um, that's one unit of measurement. You can actually go over here to options and change it to change units. Uh, where is it at? Pressure. So it was what is it? It was kPa. You can put it in bar. Um, but I have it in, in PSI. INHG is uh, interest in mercury. Um, but I have it in PSI. So, so but you don't you don't configure the actual sensors in the options tab. You, I'm saying that as, the, as something that I can point back to in a second because we're gonna need to. I don't want to go back and open it up again. So just keep that in mind that I just showed. So click setup tab and open it whenever it pops up. So. First things first, oh sorry, I'm not even looking at the right, it's input, it's an input device. Um, so map sensor one, I click over here and I go over to map sensor one. This is the map sensor that is that is connected 
to replace the stock one. Now the map sensor that's in the car is a 50 PSI map sensor. So it measures everything from about negative 14 PSI all the way up to 35 PSI. So when uh, this, by default, this was in KPA, so in that uh, settings tab that, that I showed earlier, I changed it over to, um, to PSI, so which is pounds per square inch. So I changed it over to PSI so that I could read the numbers off the data sheet. Now, uh, I got the part number off the sensor, and I went online and I looked at AEM, because it's an AEM sensor, I went to AEM's website and I found the data sheet for that sensor. The data sheet shows all of these voltages here. So each one of these voltages, 0, uh, 0.5 volts, 1.5 volts, 2 volts, 2.5, 3, all the way up to 4.5 volts. So it's a 5 volt sensor, pretty much. Um, but at 4.5 volts, the engine, if it's putting out that 35.3 PSI, that MAP sensor is outputting 4.5 volts to the car's computer. The sensor basically just takes uh, a pressure value and converts it into a voltage value. I think it was every quarter volt, so it said like 0.25 and then 0.5, uh, and it showed like at that voltage that the sensor is putting out, and it says it on the data sheet, it shows its corresponding PSI. So you would go down the PSI and or you get that PSI number and you plug it in here. So I have my variable cam timing turned off which is Honda's VTEC. So it would be a VTEC map that pops up that's right below that base fuel map. So it would say like base VTEC switched on or something like that. Uh, so let me turn that on. Click there. Under advanced. And click there. Now you can see if I drag these over um, this other little option popped up. So um, ideally when you're tuning the car you want to first you want to configure uh, you want to if you have two different fuel maps like in this case there's the there's the VTEC fuel map and then there's the regular the base fuel map which is VTEC off so one is for when VTEC's off and the other one is for when VTEC's on so you would go and tune it while it's off first which which would be deselecting it in these checkboxes that I just checked and after it's deselected in those checkboxes it shuts off that extra fuel map and that extra ignition map so you can go through and you can tune it without VTEC set it up and then you know you go through later and the VTEC. So again, tune the car with the with VTEC turned off first, and then go through and turn VTEC on, and then tune uh, the other fuel map and the other ignition map. One of the other things that was added to the car is got to go back into the setup tab. Um, so there's a boost control valve, and if I go over to outputs here. There's a drop-down menu, so I, I had to order the auxiliary harness that came with the Haltech uh, engine management. It's just a secondary harness that you plug in into an extra little plug that's on the side of the uh, on the side of the EMS. There's there's two different types of outputs that are on the auxiliary harness. There's a regular switched output, which would just be something that turns on and off, and there's another output that's for pulsed. It's for a pulsed output, and that would be for pulse width modulation, which is what controls the uh, things like um, idle air control valves, boost control valves, things like that, but it's just varying how uh, how fast something opens and how, or how long it stays open with a pulse instead of changing the resistance to it. So I'm back at this same tab where I would enable VTEC and I have DPO1 because that's the, that's the wire that I use to run to, it's a ground switched wire. So the other wire that's there's, there's two wires on the boost control valve the other wire just goes to a positive switched ignition source anyway so I put active state low because it's a it's low impedance um, if I go over here to boost control so it's uh, there what about 30 it's actually supposed to be 33 so this uh, the frequency that this operates at that the boost control valve operates at is 33 Hertz I believe I'm gonna have to look it up again um, and right now I have got it set up on uh, closed loop boost control um, <clears throat> closed loop will allow you to have a lot more boost at lower RPM instead of slowly stepping it up. Um, so Haltech's got a good video on their closed loop boost control and there's a there's a way to set it up that they recommend setting up. They have instructions on how to set it up. Um, I'm going to talk about the um, how the boost control uses PID a little bit later on which is proportional integral differential. So that's how I set that up. So I, I just set this to 30 Hertz um, control point offset, I mean this is the default that it was at. Um, 
and then I have it on closed loop. You can put it on open loop if you want and set it up that way, but closed loop is a lot better to, uh, or you, I guess you could put it on open loop if you want and have your tuner set it up. Just tell them, hey, you, I want it set up for closed loop boost control, and uh, they should know how. Um, let's see, fan switch, you can, you can change when that comes on, shuts off. Um, so, let's see. Uh, this was kind of cool too, the S2000 coolant gauge. So I have mine actually set, um, it starts at 140 degrees Fahrenheit and it steps up 20 degrees Fahrenheit every time. Like I don't really care about anything below 140, it'll hit 140 pretty fast because I mean it should be, uh, this isn't a very cold climate, um, so the engine should warm up to, a one, to 140 pretty fast. Um, and then it'll step up in 20s, 180. 200 to 20 to 40. I definitely don't want it to go over 240. So if it's if it's pegging that top um, This number six block on my on my little gauge which this is actually what my gauge looks like if you don't have an s2000 if it's if it's like hitting this number six then I Would want to get somewhere and shut the car off. So uh, Let's see All right, so that's that um so coolant pressure would be actually kind of cool. Where's it? Where's that? Like that? Uh, so auxiliary inputs, you can actually like I, I have a coolant pressure sensor in my um, in my GT4 swapped Celica. It's a GT4 engine, GT4 front end. Uh, it's a pretty beastly little car. If you want to check out the videos that I have on that, um, but scroll down here. This actually has it in the. Um, Oh, is it CPS? So, coolant pressure sensor. So it actually has it here, and you know you could CPS there. So you actually you can actually come and you can configure other stuff yourself. If you have a coolant pressure sensor installed in your car, you can actually get the data sheet on it and get these voltages. Um, none. So if I had it, I would be able to uh, to monitor my coolant pressure sensor. The, Onboard pressure sensor that the Haltech has built into it, I'm using for barometric pressure. So there's there's a brief second whenever you first turn the car on, it's uh, right before, like if you're using one sensor for both, um, right before the engine starts running, it measures bar a barometric pressure. And then whenever you start the engine, it shuts off it, it shuts it off as a bar barometric pressure sensor and it starts using it as a, a manifold absolute pressure sensor, which is what I talked about earlier. Now, if you have both of them installed, if you have two different pressure sensors, and in this case I do, um, I'm using the factory one, the factory Haltech one that's built into the box is what I mean. I'm using that as the uh, the barometric pressure sensor, so it means always measuring barometric pressure. So it's, uh, if I'm going in like ridiculous changes in altitude, like I'm driving up and you know like 5,000 feet into the mountains, like I don't have to turn the car off and then turn it back on for it to measure the new barometric pressure. Um, that's kind of the advantage of that. I mean, it's not something that you have to set up, but, uh, next thing. So the wideband O2 sensor is another input that is, oh, sorry. It's a device. So I, I bought, uh, Haltex, uh, their CAN unit wideband, uh, their wideband O2 sensor or O2, um, wideband controller with O2 sensor. Now the one that I have in the GT4 swapped Celica is uh, it's their older style, so it's harder to run a gauge off of it. I actually I've got to age. I got to have to order a gauge, but you wire the gauge into the same output wires that come off of the uh, the wideband controller. Like ne so now the way they've done it with their newer ones, it's CAN based, and it actually has wires that go to the sensor, wires that come out to the gauge, and then it plugs into the uh, the Haltech engine management just through this little can plug is like a little plug that's just called can style control area network um, it's a can style adapter and it just you plug it into the wideband controller and then you just run a little wire over and plug it into the uh, <clears throat> plug it into the engine uh, the engine management and it's easy once you plug that in um, it automatically detects and it pops up and it brings you to this screen and it says hey you've just plugged in uh, a can device you know do you want to set it up and you'll walk through the whole setup process so it um, you'll select like what kind it is I think by default 
it might have this checked already, but if this one I have is a wideband single channel, um, it's their single channel controller. They have a dual channel one also, so if you have like left bank and right bank O2 sensors, um, wideband O2 sensors, then you can um, you can do that, and you can actually buy a dual gauge that has uh, the O2 sensor, like the um, the air the air fuel ratio measurement on top, and then the air fuel ratio measurement on bottom for like you know once for left bank, once for right bank. So, but I don't need that. I just need a single channel. Um, so I have the single channel on this, but that's not all. After you check that box, you got to come over here to wideband devices and make sure WBI1 sensor 1 is selected and then O2 wideband 1 come on so you don't have to change anything here um, what you would do with this like if you install a wideband O2 sensor that is not a Haltech so this one everything's grayed out because they know like hey it's a Haltech device we know what the voltages are do not let the user change the halt change the Haltech values if you install one that's not a Haltech um, wideband O2 sensor or controller, wideband controller, all that stuff, then the the voltages might be different. Like uh, Innovate Motorsports, I think theirs is like 9 point something air fuel ratio to like 22, something like that. And then other ones, they might be from 10 to 20 air fuel ratio or AFR. Um, and that would be like, it's the same thing with the map sensor. Like at 10, uh, at 10 AFR, you have zero volts. And at 20 AFR, you have, it's, you know, it's, it's outputting five volts so if it's measuring about uh, 14 and a half air fuel ratio then it should you should see somewhere around two and a half volts so like usually whenever you get your air fuel ratio sensor the wideband controller all that stuff it'll come with a data sheet just like the map sensor did um, and you plug those numbers in here for your for your wideband controller so and since it's not a device you don't have this box checked you'll just go into straight into uh, You'll have it wired in through auxiliary wire harness instead of going in through the CAN, CAN controller port unless it has a CAN port. So that's it for input devices. Now output devices. Fuel injectors. So fuel injectors actually aren't on... I'm going to go back to that and I'm going to talk about data logging a little bit later on. How to, how to use the data log to um, tune the car. So in a few minutes I'll talk about that. So when you come over here to fuel, you can see you have you have all these little options, and I'm sure they're getting confusing. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about every one of these because you don't need to configure every one of these to take the car and to and to get it um, just to get it to where it's drivable, to where you can drive it to your tuner. Now the main things though, which I'm going to go to, which would be injector flow rate, which would be um, what like. What, what size injectors they are? Are they 570 cc? Are they 770 cc? Are you know what what are the what is the injector size? Um, so the flow rate is how much it flows per minute, like if it's cc's per minute or if it's pounds per hour, um, whatever whatever they're rated at. You, I think you can actually change it uh, pounds per hour or cc's per minute up in the options tab. The stock S2000 injectors were set at, I think, 380 cc's. That's what this was set at. Now, I, um, it's what Haltech determined what the flow rate was. Now, I don't know if they went and they mapped the fuel injectors and they, like, they figured them out on their own, like what the what the, the injector flow rate on those injectors are. Because um, I couldn't find anything online that supported that they are 380 cc. But the injectors that are installed in this. Um, they're rated at 578 cc's, but this fuel pump's upgraded. I just found out, so these are probably I should I don't know. I could change this number to 600 cc. So you plug in the injector cc's here. Now injector dead time. Um, this is what I had to email the manufacturer about. Now the injectors that are installed are uh, Ultimate Racing injectors. Um, so I had to email Ultimate Racing, which they they pretty much repackaged uh, Siemens injectors. Siemens 570cc injectors. Uh, the dead times that they gave me and the cc's that they gave me, they said they flow 600 cc's based on the part number that I gave them. And the injector dead time, which is pretty much how long it takes the injector to come on, like you know, whenever it gets the trigger, how long does it take that coil to fire up? So these are the milliseconds that it takes for that for that to start up. Um, so you want to get the injector dead times and you plug them in. There's a, a good website to go if you don't know what your injector dead times are, injectorrehab.com. 
or not .com, just Google injector dash rehab or just in, just injector rehab, um, and it should come up with a list of uh, they they have their own injectors that they've tested that they've gotten the injector dead times for. Um, so that's the injector dead time. So I changed that. You don't have to worry about all this other stuff. You can let your tuner kind of worry about all those things. If you change out your uh, like you change out your ignition coils, like mine in my car, my my um, dwell time is different. Like the um, so I'm going to be putting up a video explaining more in detail these ignition coils. If you want to go and check that out, um, I should up, have a link that pops up on this video um, around right now. I'm about to start a playlist on. Uh, everything that I know about sensors and I'm gonna try to look up stuff and fill in the blanks so uh, that's gonna be one of the things where I talk about like ignition coil dwell time like what is dwell time what is dwell time um, like it's basically it's it's uh, once the coil reaches its peak like you know it gets a trigger it starts to fire up and once it it fires up it's got that that period of time where it's at its maximum capacity of you know the voltage that it can store I guess is uh, I guess a way to put it um, before the ignition event because the ignition event happens and that the, the uh, magnetic field collapses and that's when it delivers the spark but I'll go I, I would go through that in my other video a little bit more in detail but um, with whatever ignition coils you change out there's the manufacturer recommended dwell times and the dwell time is going to change depending on the ignition coils so the coils that I have in my Celica um, in the 3S GTE, they're actually from an Audi. They have long dwell time. Um, they're they're not known to be reliable, um, but they deliver a crazy hot spark. So I like them. Uh, my dwell times on those coils are a little bit longer than uh, than what's set up here. If you change out your ignition coils, then that's a big thing. You want to change out. You want to change your dwell times too. You can't just pop them in, plug them in. Unless I mean, if they're if they're made as you know like a, as a direct replacement for the factory ones dwell time should be pretty close to the same it might be slightly off but slightly off of what the manufacturer coils are but these are the stock ones so I never adjusted the dwell times I left them the same like I said if you change them out it's very important you have to uh, you have to adjust the dwell times for the coils and you can get that from the data sheet that comes with your coils if they're aftermarket coils um, or look up the dwell times you want to look up on forums, at least try to find out what that dwell time is. But anyway, uh, so boost control. So I go down here to my closed loop boost control, and I've got this set up. Um, so my target boost, I pretty much left this the same. I didn't change this uh, this table. I'll, I'll change that later on. Uh, target boost, I just put tens all across the board. I don't want to go over 10 psi. I still don't know what the compression ratio is inside this engine. If I don't want to blow the head gasket or something crazy like that. So, onto the. So I mentioned PID earlier uh, when I was talking about the uh, boost controller. Uh, PID is a way to efficiently use electrical motors, solenoids, things like that. Um, if you ha if you want it to go up to a certain point and then stop. Uh, there's a risk when you tell it to stop it's actually going to go a little bit beyond like the example a good example that I, I heard was this example of one of these drone helicopters you know like it, it flies up and you want to tell it to stop at this certain point but when it gets to that point it doesn't just do like a dead stop it gets to that point so that, that would be the proportional the integral would be how much time do you want it before that but right before it gets to that proportional how much do you want it to taper off you know, so you'll you'll change the integral to where, like, you know, it's got, I want it to taper off, you know, just this much before. So that way, when it gets close to the proportional, in the in the controller software, it knows, hey, if I want to stop here, I'm going to have to start to stop like a little bit before. So that way, it'll start to wind down, and then it'll go. So they're used a lot. It's another efficient way to use electricity, and it has a lot to do with pulse width modulation. Like PID is talked about in terms of controller, and PI and PWM is it's actually the controlling that happens. So PID is what uses PWM to control. All right, so that's everything as far as uh, setting up all this stuff. So now that everything that's installed in the car is set up and functional, things that you would have to do is you want to modify your base fuel map, um, target AFR map, all these maps. Like just go through all the maps and look at all the ones. If it's a, if it was a stock non-turbo engine management that you bought, um, like in this case. Um, I bought the Haltech engine management. It had the base map to run 
a non-turbo S2000 installed on it. So the non-turbo S2000, I mean, these are, this is vacuum. Everything under here, I wish I could draw a box around, but you can imagine a box that would go all the way from zero to 10,000 RPM and negative 14 and a half PSI up to zero. This is where it cut off. So it didn't have anything above that. I had to add these values in. So um, you want to add these values in because you want to be able to have like a, a target AFR, a target air fuel ratio value um, as the car is boosting. Now, if you notice, you're like, you're saying like, wait, Jay, wait a second. I thought 14.7 to one was the, the ideal air fuel ratio that you want to be at. And it is the ideal air fuel ratio you want to be at. But the problem with that and with turbocharged engines and mixing those two together, if I left this at 14.7 to one all the way across, yeah, it would be efficient but it would be very hot. So my exhaust would be pretty hot going all the way up here to 20 PSI and if you have that controlling, like you have this exhaust that's spinning a little impeller in the turbo, that, uh, that heat plus the impeller is very damaging over a long period of time. So one way to remedy that is to, you change the air fuel ratio so you make it more rich all the way down to um, I think like 11 is like a safe number. I, I've seen like on a dyno, if you do anything between 14.7 to 1 and 11 to 1, it's all right around the same power output. If there's a minute difference and the best power output is around like 13 and a half um, air fuel ratio. That's the best power output. The most efficient power output is around 16.1. The problem with 16.1, or sorry, 16, uh, around 16 to 1, the problem with around 16 to 1 air fuel ratio is it's even hotter, it puts out a lot more nitric oxides, and that's one of the things that makes it really hot is the more nitric oxides. Keeping exhaust cool at around 14.7 to 1 helps prevent it from uh, making more nitric oxides in the exhaust. So one of the ways they do that from the factory is by having an EGR valve in the car, which by the way, you don't want to take off unless you're running an engine management. Um, if you're running engine management, there's usually not a way for you to configure an EGR valve. EGR is exhaust gas recirculation and really quick all it does is just take like a little bit of exhaust gases that have already been burned up and it recycles those back into the engine. I've heard a lot of people say like well it's just it's it's because you have to burn up the fuel that wasn't burned up before. Well no it doesn't do that there's not like a little catchment thing you know where it catches only the unburnt fuel and it pipes it back into the engine. It just catches random exhaust and it cycles that back into the engine as filler pretty much. So you would have like 95% regular oxygen and fuel uh, mixing together and then probably like 5% or so of um, exhaust gases. That exhaust gases, when it's used as a filler in the combustion chamber, it lowers the temperature um, coming out of the exhaust pipe. So when that temperature is lowered, what you have is uh, less nitric oxides being produced. Now, um, on the other end of the scale, when you get more to like to um, air fuel ratio that's more rich on the, uh, so it's a little bit more richer than 14.7 to one. So if it's around like these numbers, like 13 to one, 12.9 to one, 12.2, like that, as it gets more rich, there's more hydrocarbons that are produced in the, um, in the exhaust, which are also bad. So the best, air fuel ratio that you can have is this 14.7 to 1 and then as this gets more rich um, power output doesn't change efficiency changes you're, you're gonna have uh, well I guess power output does change minutely really very small um, but it does change a little bit it doesn't change that much to where it's worth damaging a turbo pretty much by running to running your exhaust too hot so uh, 13.7 to 1, you know, you get down, gets more and more rich. You don't really want to go below 10. Um, you can, um, but I, I really wouldn't like to go below 11 because I know that's the ideal. But if it's, hey, if it's, if it saves my turbo, then that's perfect. You know, I'll, I'll go, I'll go below 11 all day. So, um, so anyway, that's the reason why you have all of these. So as the car is boosting more and you're putting more and more power, you're delivering more and more power to the wheels and your exhaust is getting hotter and hotter, uh, you want to have your air fuel ratio get more and more rich. Um, if you're running a non-turbo car and you say you have like a really strong um, exhaust manifold, 
I guess you can run it hot, and you know, you could have burnt valves. You can run it uh, like 16 to 1, something like that, if you want to have a really good power output. Um, and you don't care about the environment. Um, but 14.7 is ideal, and anything between about 11 and 14.7, um, those are the best air fuel ratios that you want to work with.